Changement climatique est un problème global causé par l'effet de serre. La feuille de serre est quand la fumée de serre la méthane, le CO2 et le oxyde nitro pigeant à chaleur de le monde. Méthane vient des vaches, le CO2 vient des usines et voitures et oxyde nitro vient de l'agriculture. Il y a 15 jours chaud record pour un jour froid record à Washington DC. Changement climatique provoque plus de sécheresse, incendies, inondations et tempêtes. Il cause la température de l'hiver qui fait l'air plus aride pour des sécheresses et un certain nombre d'incendies qui tentent plus que milliards de l'air avaient trois fois plus que le moyen en 2006. La première décennie de la 21e siècle était l'un plus chaude dans un mille temps. À cause de la mer célèbre, l'usine est perdu 322 km de sa côte dans le 80 ans dernier. La pollution de l'air coûte le monde 5 000 milliards par an. Les animaux du monde ont diminué 52% dans les 40 ans derniers. Les inondations sont plus maintenant qu'avant parce que la mer se lève à cause de la fonte glaciaire. Pour réduire l'émission d'agriculture, commencez un jardin. Pour réduire l'émission de gaz, il faut que nous fassions des villes. Marchez à la cour. Utilisez le transport public. Il est nécessaire que vous éteigniez les appareils quand vous ne les utilisez pas. Les scientifiques sont sûrs que le changement climatique est vrai et il faut que nous fassions tout qu'on peut pour aider les îles menacées par l'air de la mer. La République des îles Marshall est une group des îles et atolls près d'Australie, dans l'océan Pacifique. Ils sont menacés de l'air de la mer parce que les îles sont seulement 2 mètres dessus de l'océan. Holly Barker travaille à l'Université de Washington. Elle a reçu la prix pour professeur distingué en 2013. Elle a travaillé au Lille Marshall pour Peace Corps et l'ambassade de l'île Marshall pour plus de 20 ans. Maintenant, Holly Barker enseigne l'anthropologie océanique, changement climatique et beaucoup d'autres. Il aussi parle Marshallese. Now, you know, the Marshall Islands is an amazing place, and uh, most people don't learn a whole lot about it. Um, people from outside the Marshall Islands tend to focus on its smallness and really lock into that factor that, oh, it's just 70 square miles of land, and uh, oh, it's, uh, you know, just like six or seven feet above sea level, and it's scattered over a million square miles of ocean and really focus on the smallness but if you kind of flip that around and think about Marshallese culture and Marshallese society and their kinship and everything it's based on this sense of a really expansive notion of place um, so the word for uh, the universe where they live they call it I loan it means it's I um, meaning like all of the seas and then lung meaning all of the heavens Uh, mm -hmm. So the Marshallese have always, you know, not just looked at the dry acreage that they're on, but have mm -hmm. always looked at this expansive sense of the world that mm -hmm. included uh, all the stars and all they could see in the sky and all the waves that they were navigating and traversing mm -hmm. uh, with their incredible navigational skills. Mm -hmm. They know that it's the expectation that they take care of that land for future generations. Uh, so they status, like their social status in, um, in Marshallese society, their clans that they belong to and their families and their inheritance are all tied to um, kind of land mm -hmm. uh, and it passes down through women, uh, which gives women um, one form of power in mm -hmm. the country just because land is everything. Mm -hmm. And that's a long, proud, um, strong history of resilience. Um, to live on those islands uh, where on the land there are not as many resources as 
um, some of the other land spaces, it means that they have to be extremely innovative with what they do have. So mm-hmm. when I think of Marshallese culture and society, I think of uh, history in terms of having been there for thousands of years. I mm-hmm. think of resilience in terms of um, you know knowing how to adapt uh, and to continue to thrive despite hardships. Um, and I think of family and land. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those are sort of the pieces that tie it all together. So in 1986, when they became independent, it was for the first time in 400 years. You know, each colonial empire um, takes away the sovereignty of the people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and many of those colonial empires also had strict rules about what could be done or couldn't be done. And mm-hmm. in terms of or language or religion or other issues too. Yeah, and it seems like their social structure is a lot different uh, than it is in the United States with the whole like stewardship of the land instead of just using it to kind of yeah. produce. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you're definitely right about that. And that's why um, when it gets to replacing people's land, you mm-hmm. know, or, um, you know, you can't really use a Western formula to give people market value mm-hmm. if their land is destroyed by nuclear testing yeah. or, um, you know, just the, the, there's no, you can't, you can't give somebody their ancestral ties in a new location. Mm-hmm. It just, you can't pick up and move someplace else. We have been working in the Marshalls for just about, you know, 30 years or so, and definitely over time really see the impacts of climate change. Um, to me, it's most visible in terms of um, the loss of land, without a doubt, where you know, the place that I lived during the Peace Corps, it had gun turrets that were left from World War II that the Japanese had built about 100 yards inland. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was in the Peace Corps, they were just off shore, but they were in the water. And, oh. uh, and so you can see since World War II, like well over, you know, two football fields of erosion of land. And yeah. when there's only 70 square miles of land, every every bit of it is precious. Yeah, yeah. Definitely see it in terms of the high tides and um, just the watermarks everywhere mm-hmm. as you walk around now. That was not something I saw even 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, where you can see the flooding that takes place regularly, particularly when there are tides and wind conditions. Um, that come together. Um, really see it in terms of changes of food too, because of the salt inundation. Um, yeah. That there are a lot of crops that they had been trying to grow. You know, they had been trying to work on, you know, growing tomatoes and cucumbers and more like Western um, foods that were healthier. And um, but you know, those those aren't they don't work with salt water. I also I definitely see a tension in the people. Like they they talk about climate change. They're concerned about climate change. Um, they're preparing for having to leave their islands one day. And um, water, I think, access to fresh water uh, is probably the largest concern for communities because I think that's kind of their threshold resource. Um, if they can't guarantee a clean and safe water supply, then that's going to that's when I think islands will become uninhabitable. Uh, and so people have really kind of targeted this, the fresh water now as a need. Um, and then I guess the final thing would be um, the presence of the nuclear waste facility on Inouye Talk from the nuclear testing and how close to the ocean that is and how terrified people are that this plutonium is going to end up in the Pacific Ocean and yeah. thinking about the, those impacts. So kind of the devastation of the nuclear era comes, um, connects with the devastation of the climate change era. I mean, they're they're really kind of similar stories, right? Where um, it's the lifestyles of uh, Westerners that are creating those devastations for the people. Right now, the climate change debate is kind of as a long-term discussion like a long-term problem that the next generation will have to solve but there are places like the Marshall Islands that are losing their land and going underwater right now and so how do you think that uh, like Americans can help or, um, or why should they why should they have an interest in 
preserving a place like that if it's so far away? Yeah. Um, one, the person who I think is the most brilliant spokesperson on climate change issues in the Marshall Islands is Tony DeBroom. I don't know if you've looked up any of his stuff. Yeah, he was um, nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. Right? Exactly. I mean, he's just absolutely brilliant. Um, and he was telling me this story when I saw him in March this year. It was in the Marshall Islands. And he told me the story about um, when he was talking to these reporters in Paris about climate change. And so one of the reporters asked essentially your same great question of, why should we care? Uh, and, you know, and that's like, hey, Tony, are you, are you trying to save the Marshall Islands? And Tony turned to them and just said, I'm not trying to save the Marshall Islands. I'm trying to save the world. That, you know, what's, what's happening to the Marshall Islands is, you know, the climate change is happening there sooner to the Marshall Islands, but eventually it's going to happen everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the time the Marshall Islands becomes uninhabitable, um, the dangers and the threats to other areas of the world are going to be so significant that, uh, you know, it could very well be too late to do anything. And mm -hmm. so it's imperative, you know, if the Marshall Islands gives people a reason to take action, then that's... Uh, also in their best interest as well. And so mm -hmm. addressing climate change in the Marshalls is addressing climate change in other areas yeah, of because course. of our, the way our planet is. I mean, we're, we're a globe. Uh, and so I think that's the thing. We're going to get the mindset, too, where these are not issues that happen to other people far away. But yeah, these yeah. are issues that are facing all of us in our interconnected Planet. I think like we've noticed that uh, we went to Florida over spring break and uh, they were in a state of emergency because of the wildfires that have increased a lot because of the droughts and kind of arid climate that's happened with the rising temperatures. Yep, mm -hmm. great example. I think that's a fantastic example. Um, yeah, and it's, I think when you ask like what people can do, it's like get them to see that interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. um, that the, what happens in those droughts and wildfires are connected to, you know, I live in the rainiest place in the U.S., I think. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, the drought is very much of an, that's an issue that affects us as well. It's like we have um, that our, our humanity, our, our environment is interconnected and interdependent. So a lot of times... Uh when you're talking about like a big issue like climate change, it's hard to think of like what the individual person can do because like I can't organize like to uh, in construct like millions of solar panels or like windmills or anything. Um, so how do you think that like the individual can make an impact? Individuals have great power to yeah. shape public discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, writing letters to the editor, um, mm -hmm. giving TED Talks like you're doing, um, educating other people, raising awareness, like those those are huge steps. Um, I think each one of us has a strong political voice too. And mm -hmm. I, you know, certainly you, you know that from your mom and her political advocacy <laughs> and education work, but like when a young person goes to a member of Congress and says they care about an issue, Goodness knows they want to hear from you a whole lot more than they want to hear from um, paid lobbyists who are working on these issues. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think, you know, your voice, your activities, mm -hmm. uh, and your ability to create conversations 